All right, welcome to the Adventurers Club of Los Angeles. I'm your host for the evening, Rich Mayfield, member 1211, and the program's chair this year. So we are doing these broadcasts every week at 7.45, 7.45 on Thursdays. So please subscribe to our YouTube channel and click that bell to be notified when we do go live and post new content. Um, also, remember that we do a little Q&A at the end. We will answer your questions. So if you have questions during this program as they come up, type them in the comments section. Andy will pick those up and we'll field those questions at the end of the program. So tonight, I have Rich Slater. Rich, great first name. It's yeah. been confusing all night, right? So you are a member of the club. You're a member 12... Unknown. Unknown, right? So, so Rich is one of our newest members. He, has not been in, he is technically a member of the club, but he has not been inducted yet. So he is member 12 something, something or another, but you don't get your official... Uh, member number until you're jumped in, so to speak, on a regular Thursday night when things get back to normal. So um, you were a deep sea explorer, correct? You've right. been a deep sea explorer all of your life. Oh, pretty much. And and you started just doing kind of like, from, from what you were telling me, you started as a diver. Well, <clears throat> I was born in Long Beach and I was raised in Santa Paula, just north of here. Uh-huh. <coughs> Excuse me. And I spent a lot of time diving. It's, you know, skin diving as a kid. Right. And then I was in the service and I got out, I was going to junior college up in the Bay Area and a friend said, you gotta try this skin diving with air bottles, you know, that's the way to go. And that's what they called it, just yeah, skin diving with air bottles, scuba it wasn't scuba then, or anything like that. So uh, he brought his tank and regulator down and we went in the neighbor's pool. And I thought, oh, this is great, you know, I didn't have any lessons or anything. And what, wait, what year was this? 57. 57. Yeah. So you were one of the pioneers of scuba diving. Well, I don't know about that, but it was one of the early then. ones, yeah. yeah. Uh, so on the weekend, we'd go down to Carmel. It's supposed to be good diving, Monterey area. Uh -huh. you know. And so <clears throat> I, had, I bought a tank and I bought a regulator, and that regulator I used for 50 years, a single hose regulator. Wow. Long time. It's still around somewhere. And uh, <clears throat> we would go down to, to Monterey in a place called Monastery Beach, which is just south of Carmel. And I found out later, that's one of the most dangerous shore entries in diving in California. There's it's signs posted there not to do it. You know? There's signs that's posted now. That's my first dive. <laughs> yeah. So your first dive was the most dangerous yeah, yeah. shore dive in California. It's a, it's a terrible, real steep beach and a big waves, and you had to go and crawl along the bottom to get through the surf. Mm -hmm. But it was beautiful diving. Carmel was wonderful. But I only had one tank, so I had to make it last all weekend. So I was one of the slowest breathers of all times, which is not good. Yeah. But I've always been that way. I, I can go through a single, everybody else goes through a double. Wow. So that was, your, that was your start, right? That's the way I started. Skin diving, you're just in the water, <clears throat> you love it, but you, you basically made a career out of this, right? And well, then I, 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 I majored in geology. I wanted to be in the petroleum business and oil business and geology. And uh, I got my bachelor's at, at Oklahoma in petroleum geology. And there were no jobs at that time, so I applied to some graduate schools and I got into USC. So I came back out, went to SC, and I was one of the few diving scientists that knew how to do it. So they put me in charge of the dive locker at SC. And I gave scuba lessons and the, to the faculty and some students. I checked out equipment, I filled bottles. We only had a couple of bottles and two regulators. I had a, a Roly Marine camera and a few things I checked So this was out. before like any of the uh, PADI or NAWI or yeah, any of the dive Absolutely. Any of the dive organizations. In about 1961 and 62, the administrator came to me and said, you can't check out any equipment unless they have a dive card. And I said, what's a dive card? <laughs> and I didn't right. have one, <laughs> you know. So I had to check everybody's dive card to make sure. So then at night I snuck out and took lessons in Inglewood <laughs> at Bluefin or somewhere. It's like asking the Wright brothers for a pilot <laughs> I'd pilot had hundreds of dives right? by then, you know. Yeah. But then at SC, I also, another a student with me, we were divers, and we knew some professors at Scripps, and they started a little offshore business of diving for oil companies. Mm -hmm. And so on weekends we'd work with these guys. Quite we, a bit we of did, money in uh, that now, huh? We did the uh, sewer outfalls, you know, Palos Verdes, White Point and stuff. Uh -huh. Little job, looking for lost equipment on the seafloor, little jobs. But uh, So you got, weren't doing regulatory compliance, like making sure that you were looking for equipment that they accidentally well, flushed down. Somebody <laughs> dropped some, well, 
Yeah, I don't want to talk about what comes out the end of the sewer pipes, but uh, one time I had to go up inside the pipe, and it was so small, I couldn't turn around. Uh -huh. And so I got to one of the, uh, the, what do they call it, the affluent where they, it sp splits out of the pipe. Uh -huh. So I took my tank off and put it out, and I crawled through the thing Jeez. and got out of the pipe. Jeez. But we did jobs, and we worked for oil companies up in Santa Barbara Channel diving, and we could only go so deep. Mm -hmm. With scuba, you know, and then and why why is that? Because of the depth limitation, you know. I mean, 100 feet or so. We we wanted to get samples at two or 300 feet. We couldn't do it with scuba. And did you guys have dive tables back then to know to not go yeah, that the deep? Navy, the Navy had some tables. Yeah, I didn't pay much attention to them as I remember. Yeah. But, uh, so uh, I graduated from SC with a master's, and I went to work for Richfield Oil which is a great small company, exploration company. And I was in exploration, we went all over. I spent a summer in Hudson Bay in a canoe going up and down rivers, mm -hmm. collecting rocks. So it was a great company. I came back and they merged with Atlantic Refining, and made Arco. Mm -hmm. But the trouble is they closed our lab in Anaheim where I worked and wanted me to go to Dallas. I didn't want to go to Dallas. Yeah, California is a nice place to live, right? Yeah, I didn't want to go back there. I'd been back there for a few years. And uh, I decided to go back to school and get a PhD. I was married and had two kids at the time, so I went down to Scripps, naturally. <clears throat> I talked to my friends, and they said, six, seven years to get a PhD there. You've got to go to C for two or three years and be a grunt for the professors. Oh, wow. And then, you know, it's a lot of work. It's difficult. I couldn't do that with kids and a family. But I met an Australian guy, professor down there, and he said, come to Australia. I said, hey, I'd love to go to Australia. You know, give me some money. Yeah. <laughs> sure enough, he wrote me and he got me a job with BHP and Utah Mining. They had the oil leases in Bass Strait and they wanted someone to explore the surface minerals, mainly Cassiterite tin. Uh -huh. uh, they wanted to see if it was feasible to mine the surface of, in Bass Strait. So my job was to map it for them, but I could use that for a dissertation at the university. Okay. So I was getting paid and yeah. doing a job. So it all worked out. We were there three years, the best three years of my life. Great place. I belonged to a surf club yeah. you know, and lived on the beach. It was just, it was unbelievable. No money, but we had a great time, you know. But you had enough to live and oh, to get yeah. that PhD. Yeah, yeah, and I got my PhD, so. So you sent us this picture of, of you outside of Laguna Beach diving. When did that that's come right. into play? Because this is, this is a cool picture of... of um, well, that's of, a really early picture. I don't, I'm not sure where that is. Uh, it's like one of the first pictures, Andy. Yeah, that's probably taken out in Santa Monica Bay somewhere. And, and what, what, what kind of diving this, were you this doing This is right kind here? of gear we wore. I want to show you the weight belt. It's a World War II cartridge belt. Oh, yeah? And we used to take fishing weights and put in the little pockets. And then when we go diving, if you're too heavy, you throw them out and you pick up a rock and put it in there. And that's the way, that was our early weight belt. So you were pretty tuned in, because I noticed you didn't have a, a, a BCD there on. There weren't any BCDs. No BCDs, so no, you basically had to be neutral. And, and I didn't wear a BC for a long time. I didn't trust those things. Yeah? It would <laughs> take me to the surface. Right. Uh, I finally did, but it took me a long time. Well, we're talking about it later, but you are known for being the guy that rockets to the surface, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But you see the duck feet, the old fins. And yeah, but that picture, I like the yeah. knife. It's like a hunting knife. <laughs> yeah, just whatever works, That's right? It's a hunting underwater knife. Double hose, and you see the the frame for the two bottles is just welded together. Uh -huh. You know, there's no backpack and no nothing to fit comfortable. And the wetsuits didn't fit too good. Look how wrinkled it is. Yeah, but that's the way we started, and that was when I was at SC. We uh -huh. were diving for the company out there. Yeah, yeah. So when did you first get into deep sea exploration? Well. <clears throat> from Australia, I didn't have any money to get back to the States, but I, I got a postdoc at Cape Town, University of Cape Town, South uh -huh. Africa. And uh, you remember the movie, uh, the, what was it? Endless Summer. Yeah. The surfing movie in yeah. the 60s. And they went all over the world and they found the perfect wave at Cape right. St. Francis in South Africa. So I get to Cape Town and they say, where would you like to work? And I said, I think I'd like to work at Cape St. Francis. <laughs> Are you a surfer? Somewhat, Somewhat. Not, a, not a great surfer. Body, I love it. body surfing. Yeah. I used to do a lot of body surfing. But I ended up out at sea. I could see Cape Francis, but I never got to go ashore. So. Yeah. So anyway, then I got a cable from California from my ex-classmate uh, who now worked with these guys from Scripps. They had a little company called Geological Diving Consultants. And they, in the meantime, they had gotten a guy named Doug Privet, who was a machinist in Torrance. 
to build them a submersible so mm -hmm. they could go deeper to get the samples for the oil companies. And they had this little sub called Necton, two man. And this is no, this a is a later one. This is some similar to it, but that's right. That's but a the, Necton. That's a Delta. It was Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta. So this was the Necton Alpha, the first one in the series. This is the first one. Yeah. And uh, they had a job with oil companies to go to Alaska for the summer, and they wanted me to fly home from Cape Town and be the sub pilot mm -hmm. <laughs> up in Alaska. So it was a way to get my family home. I really hated leaving South Africa. I loved it down there too. We did a lot of exploration, a lot of fun. But anyway, we came home. I went to work with these guys. I went up to uh, Alaska, spent the whole summer working in Alaska. And that's a, another story in itself. But yeah. uh, we got back on just before Labor Day. Yeah, Labor Day, in, end of August. And uh, in the meantime, the guys had been out diving to Catalina. The insurance company asked them to dive and find this boat that had flipped. It was a 27-foot speedboat, big one, with a couple of Chevy engines in it. And it flipped and sank um, by the rock quarry. You know where the rock quarry is? About a mile from Avalon. Okay. Uh, to the north or to up the, the island? To the south. Okay. To the end. And uh, they found this boat. So they wanted us to go out and, and uh, recover this boat. It, it was, was worth that much? Yeah, or we, they were doing we, an investigation? Doug could fix it up and get it running and we'd sell the boat, you know? Yeah. So, so now, now, this company, did they operate like kind of on contracts like this? Like yes. People would want them to exactly. do specific things? Exactly. The treasure hunters would always call, you know, everybody wanted to. So the, the company client. basically had, they were known, the company, we're a company, company we have a submersible. Two fellow SC students, myself, and then later a ship captain. That was the company. And you got one of these. So, yes, we had one of those. Yeah. And so we did a lot of small jobs and, and a lot of oil company work. That, one thing about oil companies, they paid well and they right. paid on time. It's a lot different than working for the government. Right. But anyway, uh, we went to, we came back and, and it was going to be Labor Day weekend and they wanted my friend and I, the two pilots of the sub, to go and recover this speedboat. And the, they had two subs in. They had Alpha and they just built Beta. Well, that's kind of a little bit better than Alpha. And we'd never seen Beta. No one had ever dove in it before. And we dove together for the first time ever. We never, the two pilots were together in the sub. Because mm -hmm. the, the other sub was Doug Privet, the designer, builder, and Dick Anderson, the underwater photographer. And they were filming it for a local TV channel, the recovery of this boat. It was supposed to, the insurance company wanted to get hold of it because they thought, th thought there were drugs on board and they weren't going to pay it off. If it was ah, any drugs if it's a on drug the boat. boat, they don't have yeah. to pay off, yeah. So we, got, we made the dive. I was the observer. I'm laying down in there. Uh, the pilot sits up. I think up. we have a cross section of something like yeah, this. Yeah, we'll Andy, see it, Andy, it, Andy a little later, up. I think. And uh, I took it down a line and a big snap hook in the claw of the submarine, mm -hmm. the arm. And we went down, we went over, and I snapped it to a big ring on the bow of the boat and we fooled around and, and Larry the other guy with me said I want to be down there playing with the arm and so we switched which is very difficult to do it's very small in there right you know we just barely could get by each other so we switched places and then they picked the boat up took it to the surface and they used the crane to hold it that we needed to get the sub back on board. So you guys are just hanging out while so they we had to hang out. make it buoyant. And so we went off to yeah. the side 100 yards maybe, you know, because we didn't want to be underneath the boat. Right. So we're away over there, both of us, and we're fiddling around. And finally they said, okay, we've tied the boat off, the, the speedboat, and uh, you guys come up. So we started up, both of us, and about halfway up there was this tremendous crash. And I don't remember too much. I just remember it was like a train wreck, you know. And what happened is the, they were retying the speedboat uh, so we could come alongside and get us on board. And somehow it got loose mm -hmm. and it sank and came down stern first. And it, instead of, it's like dropping pennies in water. Instead of going straight down, it went off at an angle. Right. Right over where we were. Just mid -water. very unlucky to oh, like, actually get hit, right? It couldn't have hit me. I'd been underneath. I'd have been safer, you know. Right. So it was a freak accident. But it hit right in the conning tower. That's and this it, part sank. right yeah. here, right? There's a picture of it. Yeah, I think, Andy, he's got like a cutaway. It's no, in the I top No, I think there's a the picture of the sub on the seafloor. 
Yeah, let's put that well, one up first. That's the cutaway. Yeah, we can. Because now at you that. were talking about this. This is this is how you guys were set up, right? That's right. So the observers lying you down. Had, the pilots. You see, I have those those uh, windows around me. The ports around my head is the pilot. Right. When it came down, it hit in that middle port on the right side, the corner of the speedboat, and it cracked the port two or three places, and it imploded. A big piece of plastic, about four inches in diameter, hit me in the side of the head. Wow. With the implosion. We were probably about 150 feet. We're not sure where we were. Uh, but it was, it, it knocked us both out immediately, but, you know, cleared our eardrums out. Uh huh. And the sub sank very fast. And Doug and the other sub saw us go by. He said, Man, you were going really fast. I knew something was wrong, you know. Now, what, what was, it was the filming for water? How, how, how was it like 300? It landed about 220. No, it was at 220 when we first picked it up. It landed at about 240. It's, some, it's controversial whether it was 220 or 240. It doesn't matter. It's a steep slope. Uh -huh. It landed on the slope. And there's a picture of it laying on the seafloor there. Yeah, see if you can find that, Andy. Uh, no, no. It'd be so, one of the early pictures, one of the first ones. So how fast did it? And there's also a picture of the broke. There it is. That's the way it looked laying on the seafloor. So this was when you guys did the recovery of this it. This is when they did the recovery of the sub. That's a big sun star on the top of the hatch. You see the I hatch, see the is, hatch open. is open. The hatch is open, yeah. You can't see the broken port. And so right, it right fell. Right next and to that it, picture, and it, it, there should be one of the sub with the broken window. It kind of went, it kind of listed over to the side. It fell on its side, so I had to kind of crawl out. Now the problem was I couldn't get out of the sub. I, I came to with the cold water. It was filling up, and the whole sub filled uh -huh. full of water, of course, you know. And I came to, and I, and I realized I was hurt pretty bad. I smashed my cheek, and that plexiglass, when it hit me in the side of the face, it sliced my face open in a couple of places. Wow. And uh, a lot of blood. And so Did I you have any to, air system in there that you could... We, we had spare scuba bottles and regulators for emergency, and neither, the two most experienced guys in the sub, neither one of us went and got it. Yeah. I was hurt pretty bad. I don't know why Larry didn't get one. We might have had more trouble if we did get it because by doing a free ascent, I just had to blow out all the way. So my last breath was under seven, eight atmospheres. So I had seven, eight times the amount of air in my lungs than you would at the surface. Mm -hmm. So the trick when I came out and going up is I had to blow out at the same rate I was going up. So you just, so waited, for, you just waited for it to fill up? I had with to wait water? for it to fill up, yeah. And then you cracked the, the then hatch. I cracked open. the hatch and I crawled out and took off to the surface. And I remember telling myself, keep blowing out, keep blowing out, you know. I think I jet propelled wow. myself to the surface. Yeah. Uh, and so I blacked out somewhere. In, in the ascent? Yeah. Probably near the surface, we think, but I don't know. Uh, I made a mistake. I told some newspaper people I saw this bright green light. Well, what it was was the surface, you know, the ocean, how bright green and blue it is. Right. You know? After being down in the dark, all of a sudden, but they thought this was some magical light that I saw, you know, and I had yeah. a hard time denying it. The know? afterlife. But anyway, I hit the surface, and I'm 100 yards from the ship, and I got a dark T-shirt, Levi's, and tennis shoes on. Mm -hmm. And so I'm laying face down in the water. I mean, I was a goner, you know, except this friend of mine was on the boat with his son, and they were fishing. And they got bored, and they got in the rowboat, and they rowed over to the kelp bed, and they were fishing. I came up right next to them. I Jeez. mean, really close. They saw the bubbles first, and they looked over there, and they saw a head in the water. They didn't know it was me. They knew it was a body. But the guy that owned that speedboat, he'd come by to get his stuff off the boat before the authorities got it off. His drugs. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. <laughs> or whatever. I don't know. Uh, and the engineer in the boat, who was a good buddy of mine from Alaska and stuff, he jumped in the speedboat and said, get going. And they sped over to where I was, and they dragged me into the boat. Wait, when you pulled this speedboat up, they were able to start it? No, no, no. Oh. The speedboat owner came ah, by in his speedboat. Another speedboat. Another speedboat. He already bought a new one after he sunk that first know. one. He was in a different boat. <laughs> and he came over there because he wanted to get the stuff out of his wreck boat. You know? Yeah. And they, so the engineer jumped in the boat. They sped over to where I was. They picked me up, got me into the bottom of the boat, but he said he couldn't give me mouth to mouth because he couldn't find my mouth. I had these big flaps of skin and oh, it was, I was a mess. And I wasn't breathing. And so they laid me in the bottom of the boat and took off for Avalon, which is about a mile away. Mm -hmm. 
and we're going, it's kind of a rough day, we're going along, so we hit a big bump and came down really hard, and I guess I came up and came down, and boom, I vomited and water and blood and all over the boat, and I started breathing. Jeez. <laughs> you know, they're all going, my God, he's, he's alive, he's breathing, you know. They didn't think, you know, I thought I was dead probably, you know. So Gee. that was really lucky. I mean, a lot of lucky things had to happen. A lot of unlucky to, things, too. Well, that's true, but I, you know, if we hadn't switched positions, if, uh, if my friend hadn't gone over there in the rowboat, if the guy hadn't come by with his boat, all those things had to happen. And I had to hit the wave to get breathing again. Yeah, and, yeah, then yeah. I got to the end of the pier at Avalon where they bring up the sailfish and the marlins, you know, uh -huh. and that's what they brought me up. <laughs> what, on, the, on the fish hook? Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> and the ambulance came and they put me in the ambulance. I couldn't have been in a better hospital. I mean, there's... A dozen people a year die at Avalon diving, you know. Mm -hmm. A lot of they, they're very experienced over there. There's no dive chamber in those days, but I didn't need a dive chamber. My problem was getting an embolism, not the bins, because right. I, I wasn't down there long enough. Right. But uh, I woke up, I was on the operating table, and they were sewing up my face. Jeez. You know, and I didn't know what happened, you know. And one of, the, one of the owners was over there, and I said, what happened? First I said, where's Larry? And they said, he didn't make it. And go, oh, God, you know, I really felt bad. And I said, but I thought maybe I was the pilot. I thought maybe I came up under the ship, uh -huh. you know, but I hadn't, of course. It was, it was an accident. But anyway, I couldn't hear for about a month. Because your ears blew out? Oh, yeah. They were going to do grafts in both my ears. Uh -huh. And I blew them out again, and the doctors told me next time something else is going to blow, so you better be careful. <laughs> right. And <laughs> you got a lot of scar tissue. Yeah, you kept scuba diving after this, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. I was back diving in the sub a month later. Wow. People just, I said, it wasn't the sub's fault. In fact, Doug had designed that sub so I could get out. Most submersibles, I couldn't have got out. You've got to have somebody on the surface undo you before you can get out. Yeah, that's pretty so scary. It, well, some, I mean, this, this one, you know, you're at 200 feet, which I guess is still possible, right, to get out. But, I mean, the, the deep ones. That, well, that I could go out at any depth as long as it's filled full of water because I had the same pressure on the inside as on the outside. See, that's why I had to wait for it. It had yeah. to be the same. So it was easy to open the hatch. Yeah. You know, that so, wasn't the so problem. So what, what, is that the deepest anybody's ever? Yeah, there's a cartoon there somewhere, Ryan. Andy. Or Andy, I'm sorry. Andy, I mean, you have, so how did, how did you wind up with this Guinness Book of World Records? Well, that's. That you sent us. Because you sent us a. I was looking for. You sent us a. No. It should be right there where the, bo the ship, the sub was laying on the seafloor. It should be right next to it. But anyway, yeah, there it is. Anyway, I'm famous because I made it to the funny papers. I'm in the comments. Oh, yeah? <laughs> the greatest according, depth according of an actual underwater escape without any equipment has been from 225 feet by Richard A. Slater from the rammed submersible Necon Beta off of Catalina Island in California on September 28, 1970. And the depth's wrong and the date's wrong. But other than that, it's pretty But it's accurate. close. So rammed, yeah, I, I was wondering what rammed was. That, that's just so Smashed, unlucky that it would know? come yeah. and smash into you like that. Yeah, it was one of the saddest things. But then we kept going and started working all over the world. Did that change? Did they change the design at all after that accident? Not really. Uh, they were ABS certified, you know. Um, and they did a lot of investigation, of course, but it was a freaky accident. That's all mm -hmm. you can say, you know. We never found the picture of the hole in the side of the... Yeah, look through those. You can pull that up. Right after that. There it is. There it is. So this is after you... This is after they recovered the sub. And you can see the size of the hole where it broke. It hit me in the side of the head. Wow. And my head would only been three or four inches. So how, that. that's acrylic? Yeah. How thick is that? Inch and a half. Huh. So it, it, what happened is it cracked in a bunch of places, then it imploded and the whole piece broke. Do in. they still use acrylic or do they use yeah. different? Yeah. No, it'll, acrylic, that's one of the strongest parts of the sub. We've tested it to 3,000 feet and you know, it won't break. Because they have like polycarbonate, right? Yeah, that's a special stuff yeah. Doug gets, I don't know. Yeah. He cuts them himself and fits them himself and everything. Interesting. Yeah. So that was the, the Nacon. Necton. 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 That was beta, beta we had the accident in, yeah. I used beta quite a bit after that. Made hundreds, hundreds of dollars. You kept using it. it. Oh, yeah. 
brought it back up and cleaned it up and wow. And we got the boat going and sold it 10 grand. And you didn't <laughs> you know, I, I, it, in the maritime community there's lots of you know, stuff where it comes to like superstition and stuff like that. Yeah. It you never know. bothered me at all. Didn't bother, didn't even think twice about it. No, I don't think so. I don't remember it. I know people were amazed that I just went out there and started doing it again, you know. Yeah. But uh, again, like I say, it wasn't the sub's fault. I felt like the I felt much safer diving in a submersible than scuba diving. Why is that? Well, we're at uh, one atmosphere inside, yeah. we're comfortable. Uh, nothing can hurt you down there, you know. You're in a yeah. steel like a, a knight in an armor, you know. Yeah. And, and we could go very deep, and we didn't have to worry about decompression. It was great, you know. Huh. So how much of that experience? You know, you recounted it to me pretty vividly, but how much of it? You mentioned you blacked out at some points. How much of it did you actually like remember? Can you picture in your mind's eye? Much. Like I say, I was hurt pretty bad. Uh, I just remember at times saying, "Keep blowing out, keep blowing out." You know, I remember that. You're, yeah. But I don't remember much else. And then it got bright pretty soon because I got near the surface. They don't know how long it took. Some people figured about two minutes to come up. Yeah, because you're not as buoyant, right? No, no, I didn't. You got to swim. Didn't have anything. You know, no flippers, no mass, nothing, you know? Yeah. Because like, so cause it, now, you know, freak, when you scuba dive, you have thing. that BC on, oh, right? Yeah. And it fills it air, and then it but starts see, I might have gone too fast with that on, you know? Yeah, well, I don't know. You know, I've, I've, I've done the free ascent, you know, where you throw your regulator out, and yeah. you, you go for, what, 40 feet or something what like I that? What I like the BCs for was bringing up heavy loads. <laughs> yeah. You know, I could feel, blow it up, and it helped me come to the surface. For sure. Know? Yeah. I never huh. needed it in emergencies, but I didn't do that much scuba diving after that. Uh, when I was in Colorado teaching, when I left after the accident, I, I worked. I worked in the Mediterranean and Africa, all over. Doing the same type of stuff. Yeah, pipeline surveys. We did Gibraltar, Straits of Gibraltar. So mm-hmm. they put a tunnel across there. Did a lot of work there. There's a tunnel the, across the Straits of Gibraltar? They were talking about it, yeah, but the geology is so messed up, it's been impossible. It's been very, and plus, Morocco, Algeria, and Spain couldn't decide on anything, you know. Between the Catholic holidays and the Muslim holidays, we hardly worked. Because, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, you guys had the sub, sub, but you didn't have, like, the tender necessarily, right? Yeah, you the, submersible, the, the definition of submersible is it has to have a mothership. Mm. You got to come aboard at night. You got to charge the batteries. You got to replace the bottles, the air bottles and the oxygen bottles, and and the scrubber. You know, we use CO2 scrubber, right? Just like the astronauts do. You know, and so all that has to be replaced uh, at night. A submarine can stay down for weeks or months or years, you years. Know, but a submersible has to have a mothership. Yeah. So wherever we went, one of my job was getting a sh- local ship. You know, with uh-huh. a proper crane and things like that. Interesting. So, tell me about the treasure hunting. Well, people always wanted us to go treasure hunting. Uh, so you're I, you're I, the guy. You're again. You, you're you're the company that has the submersible. So I'm sure yeah. there's always some guy coming after you. Be like always. <laughs> and we got more people wanting to find the brother Jonathan probably than anything else. That in the San Jose off Cartagena. We were doing work off Cartagena in Colombia. Uh huh. And everybody wanted us to stay around. And we had a permit to. San Jose is supposed to be the richest treasure ship of all times. Has it been found yet? It was found about a year ago or six months ago. Oh, wow. But the Colombian government was very... What happened, the British was supposed to have a six-foot solid gold Madonna on it. Who knows? But it was a very rich ship. And, and the British blockaded Cartagena, and the Spaniards made a run for it, and the British sank it. So they know where it went down. I mean, roughly, you know, it wasn't that far off Cartagena. And we finally got a permit from the government, Colombian government, to do the diving on it, see if we could find it. We were pretty excited about it. We weren't going to make any money off it. It was all going to go to a museum in Lima or somewhere. Hmm. Not Lima. It must have been Bogota. Um, but just when we got down there, they had a revolution or something. They changed governments, so our permit wasn't any good, and we couldn't dive, and we had to leave. We were there on a job for Exxon, and yeah. once that was over, we were going to go dive for the San Jose. But anyway, that and the brother Jonathan off Northern California. So what is the brother Jonathan? The Explain brother Jonathan that. came much later. Uh, but what, what? It was a 225-foot paddle wheeler. It was built by Vanderbilt in New York. 
Hmm. And they brought it around. Uh, and it was used from San Francisco, Portland, Seattle, Vancouver, back and forth. It carried people and equipment. It was almost identical, identical to the Winfred Scott on the wreck on Anacapa. Okay. Very similar. Anyway, it was going up north in 1865, I think. And it got real rough, storm. And so they turned around and tried to get back into Crescent City and for safety. Uh -huh. And there's a rock out there. And the huge waves, somehow the boat got in this big wave and came down and hit that rock. Usually the rock is not exposed. It's underwater. Right. But it's not very deep. And the, the ship hit it, sank. 220 people died, I think. On a, Jeez. There was a madam from San Francisco with eight prostitutes. There was a general in the Civil War. Mm -hmm. There was some relative of Abraham Lee. There were a lot of fairly well-known people. The, the governor of the Washington Territory was on there. So anyway, it was a real disaster. And there's always been rumors there was a lot of treasure on it, you know. But not confirmed? Not confirmed, no. Because the bill of lading in those days, they would hide the <laughs> treasure, sure. you know, they wouldn't yeah. say. But there was a good chance there could be something on it. So everybody wanted to, they dove that rock. Everybody dove on that rock, couldn't find a thing. What do you mean everybody? Because you're not well, scuba diving. Well, I mean, treasure diving. hunters would go out there and they dive on this rock trying to find the, uh -huh. yeah, scuba diving. But, I mean, they can't go that deep, right? It, the rock isn't that deep. I mean, so it's they, on the surface, you know. They were hoping that it was, like, sitting on top yeah, of the rock yeah, or, like, yeah. on the side of the rock. So this group called DSR out in, I don't know, San Bernardino somewhere, they got a bunch of guys together, and they got the money, and, and they wanted us to go out and find the brother Jonathan. I said, <laughs> you know, it, it takes two or three days to get up there, two or three days to get back, and they couldn't afford it. But we had been working in Alaska that summer. I worked in Alaska every summer for about 25 years. And we were coming back from Alaska right by the site, and we could stop for a day. If they pay for the boat and the boat crew, I didn't want to pay for the boat crew, you know. And my crew and I would make some dives and for, well, supposed to be for money. They didn't have any money, so we ended up getting 6% of anything we found. So that was the deal. They had to pay. So, so you're coming back from Alaska. Yeah. And they say, oh, we want you to dive it, but they don't have any money. So you're like, okay, if you pay for the crew for the day and whatever ex boat expenses we yeah. have, we'll dive it if you also give us 6% if there happens to be anything. Right. But most, probably what your calculations were at the time were, it'll be fun, right? Because that 6% is Well, nothing. I didn't even go up there, to be honest with you. A couple of guys were on the boat, and they called me that night, the first night, and uh, they... They'd found the ship. That was a big deal. What happened is the ship, and I flew up right away, of course. You know. Yeah, because that's when it got yeah, real. That's got interesting, <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, how many times? Uh, just, the just, ship wasn't anywhere near the rock. Yeah. In fact, they'd given up. All day, they'd worked the rock. And those guys, they pulled out the sonar records, and they said, see, here's the wheel, and here's the anchor, and here's the, you know, people can see anything they want. And these, right. You know, we go, yeah, sure, you know, and go down, no, it's a rock, that's a rock, there's nothing there. That's a rock, that's a rock. And so we were, they had given up, they were going to come home. And that night, one of the guys said, you know some fishermen, and that's a key in treasure hunting, fishermen, because they get their nets caught in wrecks, and yeah. fishing lines caught in wrecks and stuff. So you say, where do you get snagged around here? Oh, they also out get there about on rocks, though, two right? miles, you know. Yeah. You know, I'd maul mud, but if there's a boat, sunken boat, things are going to mm -hmm. catch on it. And, and they, someone said, well, you know, the fisherman said there was something two miles. They said, nah, we, no way it's two miles out there, you know. But that night, because they weren't doing anything better, they went out there and did some sonar, and they picked up a target. So the next morning, that's when they called me, and I flew up there the next day. And uh, the next day, we, we dove on it. They actually had two subs. There was a guy named Don Sievert here from Torrance, that had a little one-man sub that wasn't ABS, so he couldn't work for companies or anything. He didn't uh -huh. have insurance and stuff. But they brought him along, Like the too. Sublime behind you there? Did you see mm -hmm. the Sublime? Yeah. <laughs> That's a wet sub. <laughs> yeah, the wet one. So, uh, we had the two subs there, but it was this sub, Delta, we had. And uh, my son was the pilot, and Jim Wadsley, who belongs to the wreck divers here in mm -hmm. California, Southern California, 
he was the observer, and they went, and it was really murky. They couldn't see anything. It was just a pile of junk, you know. It's been down there for 150 years. You know? mm -hmm. So uh, what you do around wrecks and stuff, usually you try to get up higher because the murk is on the bottom. It's always stirred up the bottom. Mm -hmm. and it's muddy out there, and it wasn't very clear. So my son David came up. They went over the wreck, and then... They said, let's go down, and he came down kind of heavy, he called, whomp, on top of the wreck, but he had nets, <laughs> nets all around him, you know, and he, he had a hole there. Yeah. And so they were sitting there, and it kind of cleared up, and Wosley looked out, and he says, oh, my God, or something, I don't know. And there were gold coins laying around. On the, they hit, Jeez. They hit this Wells Fargo strong box and smashed it when they came down. And this is the first time on the wreck. Yeah. Well, they've been around it, you know, picking up plates. This is a plate off the brother Jonathan. Oh, wow picking up plates and cups and things like that. But uh, first time they've been up on top of it, you know, because of all the nets, and nobody wanted to go up there. Yeah. And so they didn't want to move when they got up there. They had to go straight back up, you know, to get out away from the nets. But they, they found the coins, and then they hired a couple of guys to uh, use mixed gas. It's about 300 feet of water, uh -huh. 280, something like that. And they went out, and the sub went down and took a line and sat on the wreck, and the divers came down, bounced down, and just started picking up the coins. And there should be a picture. Oh, let's see that picture. That's all right. You can show that one first. That's the safe. We found That's the safe. That's the strong box. Oh, we found the safe, you know. We, we got that thing up. That was a job, getting that thing to the surface. And they took it down to San Francisco, and it was live on TV, the grand Jeez. opening of the safe. It was supposed to be $80,000. That was the purser safe. It was a big deal. They added in water in the aquarium up there in San Francisco you know, so it wouldn't rot. Oh, that's interesting. So, so they finally had the big live TV. You know, It was like uh, Geraldo opening the safe in Chicago. You know? uh -huh. It was right after that. So anyway, they opened it up, and there was the purser's cap in there. <laughs> that's that it? That was it. <laughs> but, but this, this, this is what, what some of the... Um, throw that up there, Andy. This is what some of oh, these guys... This is what they the, filled the, the bag. Gas, and this is really bad. Gold is very easy to... Coins, you don't want to scratch coins, you know. Yeah. And of course, we threw them all in the bag. We're carrying them around and scratch the heck out of them. Right. So it lost a lot of value. You know, they'd have been... Not, everyone said, you shouldn't have touched them. You know, you should have had one. Picked them up one at a yeah, time? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We didn't do that. So we found uh, 1,200 coins. They're all half eagle, $5, eagle, $10, and double eagle, mostly double eagles, twenty dollars. There are only eight known coins from San Francisco for that year until we found this. This was the biggest treasure ever found in the state, North America, until they found the South America off Columbia. Yeah. A couple of years later, that was more. But those are the two biggest treasure halls of all times. So, with the legality of this, <laughs> now right? you're talking. Now, now. Since this was the biggest treasure hall, yeah. a lot of this legality probably hadn't the been state, established the yet. The state had given us permission to dive. You know, we okay. always go and get permission and stuff. And what do they say at that point? You haven't found it. You anything. get a permit. You know. Okay, so, yeah, so what does that it. permit been found it. get you? Like, so then we found it, and we told the state, and they got kind of interested, but we hadn't found anything on it yet. You Nothing know? of value, so yeah. it's still just the, your project. And the archaeologists for the state, don't want you touch anything. You know, Don't even take a plate up or anything. Leave it all there, you know. Which is kind of silly because nobody will ever see it. It's just right. rotting away, you know. Right. And there's a museum in Crescent City that we gave a lot of stuff to. It's a museum of the brother Jonathan now. Mm -hmm. But anyway, when the state found out we've had the gold coins, they immediately took us to court and said, "No, no, no. Those are the state coins. They're in state waters." Now, what 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 was the existing law that well, that gave them? They had four things, if I can remember them. One was we were in the three mile limit, which is state waters off. California, the okay. Fed zone three miles out. So they said we were inside. Well, the rock is inside. We didn't find it on the rock. We found it out there two miles away, and it's over three miles. Okay. But they, the state then took a three-mile limit around the rock. They'd never uh, done that before until we found okay. the coins. And so they, there's that. On there's the map that now, they own three miles around the rock. Sure. And of course, the wreck was inside that sure. zone. That was number one. Number two, they said it, it, it had to be embedded, which meant buried, and it wasn't. It was sitting on when We took pictures and showed them, no, it's sitting on top. It's embedded, and there are different rules. Uh, it had been abandoned, no. 
uh, the insurance company that insured it passed on to other insurance companies over the years and it was still on the books for somebody. Mm -hmm. So it hadn't been abandoned. They still had the books on it. And what was the other one? That was another. It was four things. And so we argued, went to court in San Francisco, and finally ended up appealing it to the, um, the sixth, ninth court? Ninth, isn't it? In San Francisco, the feds, and we won three to nothing. And then the state appealed to the Supreme Court. So we had to go back. I didn't, but the guys went back to Washington, D.C. with these high-powered lawyers mm -hmm. and presented our case. And at that point, a whole bunch of states joined California, Florida, the Carolinas, for, for treasure hunters. This is, you know, the states own these things or the hunters? Right. And the Supreme Court ruled nine to nothing in our favor. Sandra Gee. Day O'Connor said, they did all the work. They took all the gamble. They found it. Why would you take it away from no them? No shit, right? <laughs> like, Boy, you know, treasure if you just hunters, think about like we were government overreach, right? We were heroes in the treasure <laughs> business. You know? Of course. Yeah. But I mean, you're right. Like, you know, even, even with the plates, nobody's going to see that, no. right? That's, it's not that's like, what I feel, but a lot of people don't You know, like, what do they call it? Like, I don't know if it's in, imminent discovery or something like that. Like, yeah. oh, well, someone would have come along and found it. You know, there's a difference between like, you know, if you, if you leave... A, a wallet in the street, you know, if you don't pick it up, someone's going to pick it up like five minutes later, right? But this stuff isn't. Well, like one that. of the problems is it's a, um, what do you call it, a scene of death, you know? Uh huh. And so, so people take this very seriously, you know, and you shouldn't bother the dead, you know? Of course, there are no bodies on it anymore, they're all gone. But uh, so anyway, the, your state, take on the that? state, we got back and everybody's happy. Of course, these lawyers are draining us. You know, and uh, the state says, well, we're going to take you to court for something else. And they knew we couldn't keep going to court. We didn't, we couldn't fight the state. You what know? were they taking you to court? They were I don't harassing know what you? Was, but they had another deal. They were going to start all over again, you know. Did you have some, was there some like bureaucrat? Yeah, there was, was an was archaeologist, like after, archaeologist for the state of California. And he was like after you guys. Oh, God, he had it, it in ever. for you at that point. And so we said we settled. We gave him 20% of the coins. I'd like to know where they are today. <laughs> they actually took the 20%. Yeah, yeah. They didn't sell them at auction or anything? No, not that I know of. Maybe in a collection I'd somewhere? I heard rumors that the guys got some of them back, but I, I don't know what happened. But I know they took 20% of them. Some guy got a vacation home? <laughs> I don't so, know. So, okay, so the brother Jonathan, Jonathan Tra Treasure is worth $5 okay, point, so then we had $5 auction. million. Dollars. And there's a picture of the auction. There it is. Yeah, throw that up there. There it is. That was the auction we had at the Marriott out by the airport in L.A., and uh, the coins went up for sale, and we got five and a half million bucks. Wow. And I own 6%, which we were just figuring out was around $300,000 or something. Mm -hmm. Guess what? After they paid the lawyers and after they paid other expenses and who knows what, <coughs> and then, of course, they oversell these things, so they have to share it with everybody. We ended, our, my group, my 6% ended up about 30,000 bucks. <laughs> and that, that was split among how, how four, big, of us. Four, four of us. <laughs> yeah. so, so it was fun. It was fun, but I would never do it again. But you literally helped find the biggest treasure, mm. one of the, big, the biggest treasure at the time, right? It was the biggest North American treasure, yeah. So when we watch all these movies about treasure hunters that are going out there looking for lost gold ships and everything, you were the guys. You found the well, big one. Well, you know, I, I like to tell people it's the frosting on the cake. I mean, that isn't our business. Yeah. We were scientists. And, Which and is interesting. all my work is diving, diving for science. But if we happened to be in a location where they were interested, we had some guys from Berkeley. I really liked those guys. I felt sorry for them. They knew where this wreck was off the Florida Keys, off the mm -hmm. mark, way down. Uh, and I wanted to look at the side scan records, and they said, no, it's all secret. You know, So we go down there. We're doing a job in the Keys for scientists. We take a few days and we take these guys out to the site. Then he rolls out the, well, before he rolled it out, we were sitting there talking. And he said, well, what we have are ballast piles. We found these ballast piles. And if you find granite rock sitting in the Florida Keys, that's a, that's a ballast from a sailing ship. Okay. That's not natural. And that's a good way to know if a ship was there. Because normally it would be like limestone or something yeah, like that. Yeah, coral. Coral reef. Limestone, yeah. So he rolls up. So I say to him, well, you know, there are a lot of holes out there. He says, what do you mean, holes? When you look at records like aerial photographs, you can see holes or hills, you know, mm -hmm. depending on which way you look at it. I said, yeah, the, the uh, groupers make these big holes in the ground out there. Yeah. 
And he was kind of concerned about that. But anyway, we go out and we make the first dive. Of course, it's a big hole. <laughs> <laughs> Not a great If he had showed me the records in Berkeley, he would have saved himself a lot of money. You know, I really felt sorry for these guys because it was very close to Mel Fisher's, the Atosha. Uh-huh. And he, he just knew he was going to make this. You know, the guys didn't have that much money. And uh, it was kind of sad. How but did they get a, turned that, on to that particular I pile of rocks? How treasure hunters, how they, somebody points something out to them. I don't know, you know, but boy, they really get strong on these things. You know, they know every inch of the wreck. They know everything about it. Uh, but the real, I guess, I guess the key is, is you guys were scientific and commercial first. Yeah. And treasure hunting oh, is yeah. almost treasure like just a small just part a small, of it. small, small portion. But it's the ones that makes the news and... Oh, yeah, it's the yeah. cool stuff, right? People are interested. But in it's interesting to know because, you know, you watch a movie or whatever, and, you know, there's this company that goes and hunts treasure. Yeah. And the reality is, is this company goes and, you know, does scientific research and does exploratory stuff for corporations. And I can only think of two big treasure companies that really found things. One was Mel Fisher down there in the Atosha. The other guy's uh, the South America. Was that the name of it? The one they found off South Carolina. Uh, Deep water, but they found, and both of them got in trouble because they'd oversold mm-hmm. the. They got more investors <laughs> than a hundred percent, you know. Right. And and uh, I don't know whatever happened to Mel Fisher. He died, of course. But the other guy, he's on the lamb. He took off, you know, hiding somewhere. So, and oh, that, I think I heard about this guy. He took off with I think some his money, didn't Thompson he? Thompson or something. Yeah, from Indiana, Ohio, and he got all these investors, and he found millions of dollars worth of stuff. Yeah. But I don't know what happened, but so, that's w- typical for the treasure. When you guys found the brother Jonathan, right, you, you're out there with a the permit, but nobody, okay, so nobody knows. It, when you're out there with a the crew, the only people know that you pulled up a bag of gold are the people on that boat right. that were there that pulled up a bag of gold. So, but you got to remember, you got to ship, right ship's then? crew and stuff, and it's going to be all over town. But how many, how many, how many ship's crew are there? Oh, there's probably eight or ten guys on the ship, and then we had a crew of four. Our guys wouldn't have said much. So there wasn't but, like a conversation? Be like, listen, oh, guys. Oh, it was very exciting. You, yeah, I got but it was exciting, it. but I mean, nobody, nobody was like, listen. All right, there's ten of us here. Oh, yeah, we, we, had, a, we had a meeting. We could have know. pulled up a 1,200 coins, or we could have mm-hmm. pulled up 200 coins. And but, then everybody gets a fair share. I'd rather not get into that, to be honest. I feel like <laughs> I feel like there would always be a weak link in your crew, right? There's like there one is, guy that's gonna was. go, that's gonna go blow it all in strippers and cocaine, and then he's gonna come back to the rest of the group. But Let's that, just that, say that, the number of coins we brought up didn't match the number of coins they had at the auction. Huh? Interesting. But you're well, not saying anything. I don't know. You know. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't keep any. Oh, I should have kept one at least. You know. I thought you had one. I, well, that's a long story, but... I want to hear it. What, uh, what happened to your one coin that you had? I questioned some of the owners, some of the guys in this group, and said, wait a minute, you're missing some coins, you know, and I got 6%, and where's the other coins? Yeah. Well, you know, there's a lot of legal things going on, and we got to be hush-hush about this and all that. So I kept after him year after year. Finally, after seven years, I think the the limit of ran out on it or something and he said what we're going to do is we're going to donate these coins to St. Jude's Children's Hospital mm-hmm. it was better for them they'd have a write off and all and, oh, the problems they'd just give them to the Children's Hospital you know he nobody's going to come after you for nobody that nobody will right? come after you for that and so he said however we've told St. Jude's that you can buy one from them for $600 so, okay, so I donated $600 St. Jude's, and they sent me one of my coins. That's, oh, that's nice. That's how I got the coin. You know? Yeah, you had, to, you had to pay for it after you pulled it up I off the I had to pay for it. Yeah, I should have stuck it in my booty. So uh, how come that coin's not sitting on our table here? Well, I had it on display in our house for years and years, and I was very worried. I travel a lot. I'm always gone, and mm-hmm. I was worried that somebody would take that coin because it was getting more valuable all the time. How know? much is it worth? I, the last time I looked, it was about fifteen grand or something. Oh, you know? wow. It was a twenty. A, a double eagle, a beautiful coin. So if you got, if if you had a stuck three <laughs> coins, if you if you stuck three coins in your shoe and or think, in your wallet or whatever, a few people which would, did that, which would fit, with you. you would have, because you made 30 grand off this whole endeavor by the, the time problem it was done. is, if you'd taken some, you couldn't really sell them because everybody knew where they were from, you know. Right. Most of the people who bought them at that auction were Saudis. 
Interesting. You know, overseas people, you know. But anyway. Yeah, you probably sell them to so them. What, so about a year ago, I thought, I'm going to give this to my son. He's the one that picked up the coins. You know? Okay. And he, so I put it in a little box. Uh, Hulu or something, a little thing I had. For like a team. little streaming box? Yeah, a little streaming box. Look like a matchbox kind of. Right. And I wrapped it all up, sent it to him for Christmas. About a month went by and never heard anything. So I finally asked him, Dave, what happened to that coin? He says, what coin? I said, I, I gave you a co the, co the coin from the brother Jonathan for Christmas. The dead silence. <laughs> it was a month later, the trash is long gone, you know. Right. Dad, I never saw it. I said, oh, my God. Well... What can you do, you know? So about two, three months went by, and their son was a student up at Northern Arizona. Yeah. And uh, they went up, he and his wife, and I guess his room was a mess, so they were cleaning up his room. And his wife said, oh, look, here's the stick for the TV that we gave our son for Christmas because they, they yeah. already had one. David yeah. had one. So he said, here, Logan, you take it, you know? But he never did anything with it. It was just sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> so Dave's wife opens it up, and the gold coin falls out. <laughs> They, they were screaming. You know, they couldn't oh believe it. Oh, my God. You know. He called me. He said, we found the coin. I said, oh, well, that's nice. So now it's in Tucson. Oh, that's good. <laughs> that guy's not lost. It's in some <laughs> landfill somewhere next yeah, to a... Yeah, I thought it was gone, you know. Next to a Roku or some crap like yeah, that. <laughs> that's, that's done with. You know, it's funny in archaeology to think about. I, I think they said this in some movie or whatever, but they're, they're talking about, like, you know, finding a coin somewhere and tying significance to it. And they said, oh, like my, my dad's, up in my dad's closet, there's a shoebox full of coins from like all over the world. That doesn't mean that those people came here, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, that was fun. Yeah. But anyway, I, I was a professor for eight years. What, in, were you, what did Colorado, you teach? In Colorado, oceanography, okay. marine geology. And this was after all the... No, this was after the, before this stuff. This was after, I, after the accident. I'd worked several years with this company and I finally decided... I was gone all the time. Mm -hmm. and, I, and a PhD is a teaching degree. And I thought, oh, I like to try to teach. So I got a job at the University of Northern Colorado. And uh, I was there about seven or eight years. I was a department chairman for six years. And I loved it. The kids were great, you know. And I did a lot of field trips to Jamaica and St. Croix and the BVIs. I, I take the a, students. That's a cool teaching breaks. job right there. Oh, yeah. Oh, we, we got to go charter see. a sailboat. We got to go get a sailboat. I taught them how to sail, and we yeah. sailed all over. We dove on wrecks, the wreck of the Rhone. Uh, had a great time, and the students loved it. I was very popular in my course. You know? I'd say. They had, to have, they had to be certified, uh -huh. and they had to take my coral reef class. Uh -huh. So... It started with like eight students, and at the end, I was having close to 30. You know, and I said, that's it, you know, too many. Yeah, well, that's a but, lot of uh, students to wrangle in the British Virgin Islands. Well, you know, when you're wherever. diving, and then one of them, I say 100 feet, nobody goes under over 100 feet, you know. Yeah. But everybody can go to 100 feet. But then you I get look, that and there's shelf. a guy going down the wall, you know. And yeah. so I got to go after him, and there's some girl struggling up there, and I go, ah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so were you like the dive master on these? Or yeah, I ran the whole thing. Master? I ran the boat oh, and did yeah. the whole thing, you know. So That's a lot of diving. It was a lot of diving, yeah. So tell, okay, we'll back up. I want to know where you got this lobster claw here. Can we see this lobster that, yeah, claw? Yeah, sure. Let's, this is a. Can I hold this up to my yeah, face? Yeah, sure. This is a, uh, this is the small claw of the lobster. You know, the big, oh, the big Look at cruncher. That. Look at that. Ah, it's huge. <laughs> this would, this, like, I'd be afraid of this. <laughs> you wouldn't want him to grab hold of you. You said this is the small this that's, is the non-dominant one. Yeah, that's the small claw. The big one was gone. He'd lost it. That would have been but great to, to have To what lobster? Did, like, a, like a crack well, in it? Lost we did it a lot of a work. In fact, I totaled up my dives one time, and I have made more dives off New England than anywhere in the world. So, so where, almost all where of it's lobster in? off New England, but it was deep water lobster. They How lived, old was that sucker, you think? Oh, pretty old. Like 80 years old? Possibly. At least 30 you know, I, I don't know. You know. You'd have to ask the biologist, but he's pretty old. They get bigger. Every time they molt, they get bigger, you know, so. Mm -hmm. But nobody fish these guys. They're all big, and they're, they live out on the edge of the continental shelf in these submarine canyons out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we discovered them and started doing a lot of research on them. And, of course, the, the word leaked out, and then pretty soon all the fishermen were out there fishing for them. How do you fish for these? Traps. Pots. So you just build a giant trap. Well, big ones come up on top sometimes, you know, and you've got to grab them before you 
after they jump back in the water. Good Lord. But no, they're big traps. Did they're you eat traps. that claw? Did I eat it? Yeah. Yeah, I tried to break it. You can see on the hammer marks, I was beating on it with a hammer. Oh my and God. I couldn't Where? break it. And somebody said, what are you breaking oh, it yeah, for? Oh yeah, there's a the hammer mark it. right so there. I, I got a hanger, there's, yeah. There's a little hammer mark <laughs> right in there. I got a hanger. And, and you uh, fished out the all the hanger meat? And I fished all the meat out. There was a lot of meat in there. Oh, wow. That's like, that's like three lobster rolls right there <laughs> in one. So I'm sorry, where, where exactly did you say it was? Off of what? Off what's, New England somewhere. Which I don't you remember. don't remember you know, I think state. it was more down off New Jersey, if I remember right. But somewhere yeah. along the shelf, way out there, deep water. They live in three, four hundred feet of water. And you're specifically doing research on these guys. Yeah. And and what's the status of these giant? You know, lobsters have come back. They're a lot. Of, they're pretty plentiful. But that big? They have a lot of rules now. They don't take females. They don't take them undersized and all that. Right. So. But I mean, you can take that one. Well, I don't know on the big ones out there. Yeah. I'm afraid we got the granddaddies. You know. Yeah. That's but, crazy. Uh, I'm sure there are a few out there somewhere. That's insane. I don't know. So so another cool thing here. Tell me about this. Oh, this is an interesting story. This is one of the last jobs I did, actually. This looks, um, this salt. is a rope covered in salt. Yeah. And what happened, we got a guy here from Southern California, had done research, in fact, and discovered that Sodom and Gomorrah were under the Dead Sea. Uh-huh. And I said, this is another treasure that doesn't hunt? make sense. The Dead Sea's been falling. They should be above the Dead Sea, not below it, you know? Okay. He said, oh, no. Satellite photographs, he found a pyramid, and the you know, same old deal, you know, they look at these records and they see things in it. Mm -hmm. So, okay, if you want to go pay us, we'll go. So he got Channel 2, I think, in England to put the money up, and they're doing an hour special on search for Sodom and Gomorrah. So I go over there, as I do, and look for a boat. There are no boats on the Dead Sea. There's one little tourist boat, a crappy little thing. It wouldn't be any good for us. And so I got, found this Israeli guy that had some boats over by Tel Aviv, and he had this real good speedboat, or it was like a PT boat. I said, where'd you get that? And he said, six day war. I said, got it down in <laughs> Egypt somewhere. <laughs> I, well, it wouldn't do any good for us because it didn't have a crane as a high deck. Right. He said, I'll tell you what, I'll build you a barge. We use oil drums and cover it with a flooring and I'll put a little shack on it and a crane and we'll tow it around with a little boat. I said, that'll go, that'll work, you know. So let's do it. So I flew back and he built this barge and he had it out there in the Dead Sea and unknown to me, he- Do we have a picture of this? Is this, pull, pull that picture uh, up of the there, boat on the truck. Well, show the lead one, yeah. Well, yeah, let's see that one. Any of those are all right. So this is- Yeah, this is us arriving at the Dead Sea. What happened is- uh, Is that Masada? No, it's a little bit north of Masada. Okay. Masada's just to the south there. So what happened is we had to get permission from the Palestinians, from the Israelis, and the Jordanians, because they all share the Dead Sea. Okay. Uh, which isn't easy to do. We had Arafat signed our <laughs> really? permit. Yeah. And King, Yasser Hu Arafat King, had to and King Hussein's guy signed it for him, you know. So anyway, uh, all the movie people, you know how they are. God, they ride with truckloads of gear and stuff, you know. And we had to do things over and over again. But anyway, the guy that made this barge in the Dead Sea, the, the Geological Survey of Israel came to him and said, can we borrow this for a week or we'll pay you? You know, we'll use it for a week. We want to do some geophysical work out in the Dead Sea. And he said, sure. So, And what they did is they, they lowered charges in the Dead Sea and set them off to... to for geophysical prospecting, uh -huh. you know? Well, a week before we got there, the Israeli papers were full of the nuclear test in the Dead Sea. Oh, God. And, it was, and the Palestinians were upset. Oh, so the, they didn't get oh, permits to blow no. up? To, to well, I don't know. Drag. I didn't know anything about this. It was our barge, you know? Yeah. So you got permits from Yasser Arafat, uh, King Hussein, and, and the and, Israeli and, and, whoever. And, you know. Yeah, but but they, they just towed that barge out there and started it, dropping bombs. started dynamite. dropping bombs, you know? Yeah. So. So I didn't know this. And so we get in, in a 747 in LA with the sub in a 747. This sub fits yeah, in? Yeah. We put you it flew in. it over there? Yeah. We How does it, it fit? How much, well, did it that, how much did it cost? Uh, I don't know. They were paying for it. Uh, it's about 15 feet long and it weighs about a little over 5,000 pounds. And you can just 
tell an we airline that you want to yeah we went down and I said, yeah you got to box it up so we built this real flimsy box around it that wouldn't do any good <laughs> just so it was covered and they put it on the plane and we flew over with it on the airplane huh. so we arrive in tel aviv and we get out and all the press and taking pictures and just, uh, well, this is unusual I and mean, we're used to that sometimes because people are interested in what we do you know right but it was kind of over the top you know so the next day, and they started asking me, what are you doing? We're looking for Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, yeah, sure, you know. Sure you are. <laughs> sure you are, you know. Does this have to do with the nuclear test, you know? <laughs> Is he looking for gold and all that? So the next day, the headline comes out, CIA sends secret sub to the Dead Sea to, to check investigate the, the nuclear oh blast. Oh, my God. <laughs> so now, now everybody's trying to interview us about the nuclear test in the Dead Sea. Jeez. It was terrible. So we finally got away, and then King Hussein died that week. So your permits? Permits no good, because the new government, they got a new guy, you know. Same thing happened in Colombia. And so now we, the half of the Dead Sea is off limits to us, you know. Because right. we can go down and go under, they don't know that. Yeah, you know? yeah. But uh, some of the targets were on the Jordanian side. But the Palestinians are really good to us. They didn't have a problem. The Israelis didn't trust us. They kept flying jets over us and stuff. Yeah, and they're flying jets all over there anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, we go out there, and we're going to die. Well, now, it's very salty, the Dead Sea. Mm -hmm. And this is a line we had on the barge, sitting there for a month in the water. So, this was a month? Uh, One maybe month. a little more than a month. Okay, so we'll we, say two I went months. To, I went to pull the months. line up, and the whole line was covered with salt. So, I took an axe and chopped it up and gave everybody in the crew a piece of the, Jeez, <laughs> of the line. Jeez, two months in the Dead Sea. And that's what happens to a line. Yep, and okay. anything else that gets in there. Well, what happened to your submarine? Uh, we washed it down every after every dive. You know, we had yeah. a big thing of fresh water, and we had to scrub it down. But the sub wouldn't go down. It it was would float. You know, the, we had to put lead in. And there's a picture there. That yeah, picture, pull that up. Sixteen hundred pounds of lead I had to put inside the sub. That's it, right there. And you put that inside. Physically, I'm inside, sitting with it like, on both sides of me, between my legs, behind. I, I'm like trapped with all the lead around. Huh. You know? And I finally got it down. In fact, Doug had figured it out. And he was exactly right. He knew to the pound what it'd take to get down. Yeah. And uh, so we dove, and of course the targets weren't pyramids or anything. What they were they? Well, it was salt. kind of pretty actually. Uh, it's all salt. I tell people I found. Uh, uh, What's the guy's name? It's Sodom and Gomorrah. The salt pillar, whoever. whoever yeah, the salt pillar. He looked back. Lot, Lot's wife. Lot. I found Lot's, Lot's wife. wife on the. She spread all over the bottom of the Dead Sea. There's a lot of Lot's wife. <laughs> but down with there. our lights, it's just like a crystal palace. You know, all the salt oh, wow. crystals. It was kind of neat. You know, different. Yeah. We actually found some bacteria and stuff. They didn't think anything lived in the Dead Sea. And so some of the scientists with us were really excited that we actually found. And deeper down, there is a little bit of. Do you have pictures of the? Of the salt? Yeah. I don't, you know. They're in the movie, I think. Yeah. You know. But uh, anyway, that was quite, a, quite an adventure. That, yeah, that would be. Yeah, that's crazy. I've been there, and I, I, I remember, you know, obviously, like, you float weird, right? Like, you're just, like, laying on the water. Yeah. The other thing I remember is, if you got any of that water in your eyes? Oh, yeah. It was bad. Yeah, you really float. You know? Yeah, I remember the mud around it because when you got off the, uh, we had zodiac and we go ashore. We stayed in Jerusalem every night in a hotel. Oh really? Yeah, we had no place to stay. All the Don't resorts, resorts are way there? up. Yeah, they're way up off the lake. It was easier to get a car and drive back to Jerusalem and sleep in a nice hotel. Interesting. Yeah, very rare. We hardly ever did that, you know, in any of our our dives and stuff. That's pretty crazy. Uh, what else we got? We got well, the uh, Lu Lusitania. Yeah, what, what, what's the deal with the Lusitania? What did you do with them? Lusitania. That's not salty water from the Dead Sea. That's fresh, purified no, that's drinking good, water good, from good fresh water from Ralph's. Um, I have a good friend, Bob Ballard, who went to USC, mm -hmm. and uh, we knew him at Woods Hole. I spent time at Woods Hole too, back in Massachusetts. And uh, Bob asked me if we'd come to Ireland with him and dive on the Lusitania. And I said, yeah, sure, that'd be great, you know, I'd love to do that. Uh, and National Geographic wanted to do a hour special and an article for the magazine and a book on it. And so they hired this huge ship. God, it was about the size of the Lusitania. 
which is not good for us because it's real high freeboard and they have to dangle the sub when they lower it into the mm -hmm. water, you know, and that's not very good. But anyway, we could work with it. Is that the scariest part of the whole operation? Yeah, you're dangling, absolutely. Bouncing around, you know. And the surface is always the worst, like scuba diving. Yeah. You know? Once you're underwater, it's great, you know. Yeah. But on the surface, the, the poor guy laying down there, he can't see anything. You can get seasick pretty easy. You never got anybody get sick in the sub, though. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, we shipped everything over to Ireland, and we went out, and uh, this ship was unbelievable. It had that, you know, they could control it. They could move it 10 feet this way, 10 the feet The vector. Yeah, it was pretty neat. And so uh, we dove on the Lusitania. It's uh, 730 feet long, I think. This is a picture. Yeah, that's Pop a that picture up. of the sub on the wreck. And so the, where was this taken the, from? This, this is an artist, taken... of course. This is an artist. Oh, this is an artist rendering? Yeah. Oh, they're really murky. You could already see down there. Um, so where do they get that, that picture of the actual Lusitania? Well, I took the artist down a couple of times, and we took a lot of photographs. What he did is took out most of the nets. This thing's covered with nets, and he had to huh. take those nets out. The other interesting thing is he made the water's green. I mean, it's really an eerie green. It's off Ireland, you know. It had to be green. Yeah. So, and he couldn't believe how green it was when I took him down there, you know. So he painted it green, and National Geographic said, no, no, no. Uh, I mean, blue. They're blue. <laughs> he had to repaint them. Well, it, pull that up again. This is interesting, because how there's many, a, how many feet of water one. is this? There's another one of the whole ship. It should be right next but to But how many one. feet of water is this right now? About 300 feet. This is 300 feet. So there's no surface That's the illumination. Bow. That's the So, bow. you know, if you're looking at this artist rendering, if you know anything about depth, like, I can see the sunlight poking through the water. Oh, this guy's unbelievable. Yeah. He did the album for the cover of Time magazine. But, does, but took some liberties with the realism of well, it. Well, they do a little bit, but, yeah. I mean, he, people think they're photographs. Yeah. You know, there should be another, there it is. Now, that's obviously a drawing because you'd never see the whole ship. So it's 700, looks very realistic, 730 though. feet long. It was torpedoed. It was mm -hmm. very controversial. We can't, that's a whole hour to talk about that. But, uh -huh. you know, whether they, anyway, what very it, what, controversial. What was controversial about it? Well, the Germans sank it, and they said there was munitions on board. Uh, when the torpedo, the guy, he had one torpedo left. He'd missed his other shots the month before. He had yeah. one torpedo left. He was going back to Germany. Oh, here comes a big ship. Let's see if we can hit it. Hit it square, you know, it, and the, a couple of others, the torpedo didn't even go off, you know, but this one went off, Yeah. but 12 seconds later, there was a big explosion, and so the rumors are that it was full of munitions, which are illegal, but the Americans were sending, this is pre-World yeah. War I, just before World War I, you know, so that's very controversial. We were supposed to find the munitions, you know, unfortunately, it's That laying, was your job to, to yeah. what, what would have come of that? Um, know. You know, oh, oh so... The Lusitania did did have munitions. I See, guess the, you were right, Germany. The, <laughs> Our bad. You know, the Titanic <laughs> hit an iceberg and sank. End of story. The Lusitania's got so much involved in it. It's just unbelievable. It's really a mystery. But who who paid you to go look for munitions? National Geographic. Oh, okay. So it was just a curiosity piece. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, that was kind of, you have to have a goal. You know, that was the goal. Mm -hmm. you know? And so uh, Bob so and National I, Geographic a seized on right like, there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, pull that up. I belong, we belong to the Explorers Club in New York. Oh, yeah. Shout out to the Explorers Club. You, you took their flag. Now you can take our flag on this. Yeah. And they gave, this flag is a really low, they have a different, you guys. They only have like 200 flags. And you've got to give the flag back. You, you, that's the same here. You, you, oh, I thought you could keep the flag. No, here. you got to give it back. Oh, okay. That's a deal. I was misinformed. We've got a whole room full of flags but This over was there. a real low number. This flag had been on top of Mount Everest. It had been both to the North and South Pole. They have a history of each flag, you know. Okay, that is different. So here, each expedition gets a new flag. Yes. Yeah. Here you get a used flag. Now, some of the early ones, they don't give out anymore. You know, you get a number 100 or 200. Right. You know, I think there's 200 total. Yeah, no, we don't recycle them. So we took it down. You have to take it down to the Lusitania. You, know? mm -hmm. <laughs> you have a picture of it down there or just up no, the surface? No, we did take it down, though. A lot of times we don't do what they ask you to do, but this time <laughs> it was easy to take a flag down. It was yeah, a big sure. deal, you know. So. Yeah. so it was quite an operation, and uh, they, they wrote a book about it. Yeah. Uh, National Geographic. I see it in the store sometimes, even today. 
and uh, it's even on TV. It's, it comes on about once a month, I think. Yeah. On National Geographic Channel or something. You know, the I mean, it's fascinating. Yeah. Everybody you know, knows that. So you can see the little the little sub on the on that church on the side of the. That's cool. Thing. So it was good. It so was good. you know what, what's the what's this guy that's been staring at us? He's pretty. That cool. is a nogi. A nogi. I've never even heard a of a nogi. nogi. That is, is an underwater diving. Uh, they they put out they present diver of the year in the United States, and uh, it's pretty prestigious actually. The Underwater Society of America. This is the Nogi Award of 1988 for science. For science. So I was named diver of the year in the United States for science. Mm -hmm. And all my buddies Ballard and these guys that all won it ahead of me. Yeah. So, and they vote, so I think I, that's how I got in. <laughs> so what, what did you get specifically that year? Did you do something You know what, when I got or? that, I was at a meeting, an ocean geological meeting in Seattle, and the guy walked up. I was giving a talk, and at the end, the guy walked up and he says, by the way, I want to present you with this, and handed it to me. Oh, thanks, and everybody clapped, and that was the end of it. Whoa. Actually, I wrapped it up in bubble wrap, and I went through the security in Seattle, and all of a sudden, there's all this commotion and stuff, and all the girls came running over. They thought it was an Emmy or something. They, they wanted to know what I had done to win this award. It kind of looks like, yeah, you know, it's got that. It was all wrapped up, you know. So. Yeah. Anyway, this it's is. It's beautiful, though. It's I mean, wooden it's hand, one. hand carved out of wood. I was telling you earlier, the, the ones in the last 20 years have made out of crystal. I'd much rather have this wood one. Yeah, That's cool. So. I mean, even the little plaque is, is carved out of a solid piece of wood. I told you, like, James Cameron got one a few years ago for his dive in the Marianas Trench uh -huh. and his hot rod submersible. His hot, his hot, his why is his a hot rod? <laughs> well, it was like a, he dropped like a rock and then came back up, you know. Oh, yeah. Anyway, uh, he said it was much harder to win a Nogi than it was an Oscar. Huh. <laughs> so it's fairly only, prestigious only few at that given point. out a year, yeah. Right. Yeah, so everybody you've ever heard of in the dive industry has one just about. So, you know, that, that, that reminded me of something else. You, you, you said you also dove the crater, the nuclear craters. At, That's true. At Bikini Atoll. That's when I was working out at Woods Hole in the summers. And this is interesting. The government decided they needed to know what the actual size of the nuclear craters are. And the only surface ones that are in the world are out in Eni Weetok and Bikini, where you can actually, the crater's still there. Okay. From the 1950s, early 60s. And so our job is to go out and, because they've been slumping and filling the sediment, so to find the actual limits of the blast. That and seems reason, like it's a sonar The reason job. they wanted to know this, believe it or not, they were building silos, missile silos in North America, and they wanted to know how far apart to put them so if a bomb hit one, it wouldn't take two of them out. And so they were going to put the silos a certain distance. However, we found how big the, the, the bomb was, you know, the crater was. So we spent a whole bunch of time out in Area 51 and the Meteor Crater, and a guy named uh, Gene Shoemaker was with us. He was a very famous lunar geologist, crater guy. Isn't, a sh isn't sh Shoemaker Crater is like a crater on the moon, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah, he's got a meteor's name for him, and he was killed in an oil bill accident in Australia, unfortunately, quite a while ago, but great guy. But anyway, we, so we go out there with a sub, and there's some pictures here. Uh, yeah, that'll be a good one. Um, anyway, we talk the second biggest atoll in the world. Kwajalein's a little bigger. You got to go to Kwajalein before you can go to Anyway, we talk. So what are we looking at here? Okay, this is a map of two craters. You can kind of see the outline of two craters that overlap each other. Those lines are the subtracts, and the colors mean what kind of bottom it was, rock or sediment or something. Okay. The one on the left, the bigger one, is Mike. Mike was the first H-bomb, very okay. first H-bomb. It's a, over a mile wide and 175 feet deep. But it slumped in, and so we couldn't get the exact measurements. It was trouble. And then the second one was Koa. Koa blasted off. Five islands disappeared when Koa went off. The one on the left. Put that The one on the there. right. The one on the right. So the one on the left was the first H-bomb. first one was the first H-bomb. And the second one appears to be smaller. It is smaller. It wasn't as powerful. But they did them at different strengths to see how big craters they made, you know, uh -huh. or how they worked, I guess. The last one they did was oak, and I don't have anything with oak here, but we did a lot of work in oak. And it was put on a barge, and they were going to blast it off. And they had a storm, and the barge got loose and drifted over by the reef, and they thought, screw it, and they blew it anyway. 
and blew a big hole in the <laughs> reef. <laughs> so for geologists, it was great. We'd get inside the reef, you know. Yeah. It was fascinating. They didn't want us doing that. We were supposed to be working on the craters, but we'd sneak out once in a while. We found caves with stalactite stuff exposed in the reef. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was really great. But anyway. Because, yeah, you get, like, yeah, it exposes all that, right? Well, then what happened, never... a big piece of the outside of the reef slumped off. So you this. get like a cross section. Yeah, we got a cross section. That's it's great for geology. So yeah. what kind of precautions did you take from like a contamination Radiation? standpoint? The first year we went out there, you had a guy with us all the time. You know, every day check, we had to wear badges and all that. Right. You know, the TLDs. Zero. Yeah, zero. Nothing. Second year, they didn't even send anybody. <laughs> yeah. Know? So no, the, only, mean, the only things be... that were a little bit hot, there were a lot of Japanese uh, equipment, tanks and trucks and stuff sank in there. Uh -huh. And they were a little bit radioactive, but they were the only things, and we weren't working with them. Yeah. So we finally figured out that picture, yeah. They had, believe it or not, they had rails from the place where they watched the explosion all the way out to the where the bomb went off. And they had a tube, and they could look through this tube. You can't see the tube now, but it was up on top of those rails. And they watched the bomb go off. So this was underwater? Yeah, yeah. And so we figured out that wherever the rail stopped would be where the end of the damage is. Oh, you know? that's interesting. Yeah. So that's were the these like spokes or did they just have one yeah. rail? Oh, they had just one, but it still gave us an idea. And what do you mean they would look down it? When they set that bomb off, they had cameras looking through a tube at the bomb going off, the actual explosion. Went all the way out to where the bomb was. They had multiple cameras or just one camera well, looking know. all the way down exactly the tube? I exactly how it worked. But they were actually watching it, you know, to see how it worked or something. Huh. I don't know what they did it for. So what was that big? And so plume? these are the remains of that, of that pipe. So know? what was that big, like, plume on top of it? You know, like that this thing. You mean when the bomb went off? No, no put that put that picture back. Oh, there. that's growth. That's coral. Oh, that's coral. Yeah, because just, two of them yeah. have it, and then one yeah. of them does. Well, that's and just I'm coral to growing on it. So it's just how fast, you know, in yeah. fifty years that animals take it over. Yeah, know? it's crazy, huh? So that was quite an experience. Yeah, I'd say. It was a lot of fun. There's a picture of us diving on the edge of a crater. I don't know if it's... How, how should, deep is the crater out there? should be right next to that one. Uh, Oak was 200 and some feet deep. Mike was, I think, 150, 160 feet. Very mm -hmm. boring. Just mud, you know. Yeah. Not very exciting. Yeah, that, that picture. That shows a diver going along the edge of a crater. So now, did this guy, like, lock... Did you have another sub... Merciful that you locked out of, or did he just no. dive from the no. surface? No, no, this was just using this sub. Because you were telling me about a story earlier about um, some lockout the diving lockout? you did. Well, um, yeah, you know, we didn't talk about it, but you said you were a, a, an aquanaut in the Bahamas, it. right? Yeah, when I was teaching, I was uh, elected. I don't know what happened. They named me as, as an aquanaut. <laughs> okay. <laughs> U.S. aquanaut. Yeah. And we did stuff underwater for weightlessness for the astronauts. They wanted to know about the bones, the, you know, in space, weightless for weeks at a time, okay. what would ha how it would affect their bones. And so we went through a lot of x-rays and tests on and stuff. And then we'd live underwater for a couple of weeks at a time. In like a? In a habitat, it's just a <laughs> sewer pipe <laughs> with, you know, two ends on it. But and you're they, still they pressurized like that thing. And we had bunks in there. Mm -hmm. And they pressurize it to wherever we were. And the one we're going to talk about was in about 60 feet of water. But so how would that mm, not... We, we go not. down, we go inside. Of course, they pressurize it inside so the water couldn't come in. Yeah. And there were double hatches on it. And then we could go out and dive all day, you know, and, and come back. We didn't have to worry about decompression or anything. It was great, you know, right. work on it. One interesting thing, people, kids used to ask me, what did you use for the toilet? And there wasn't any toilet. You just swim but out you'd there. you'd go out, you'd go out bare ass, grab yeah. a tank under your arm, swim over to the local <laughs> coral, go behind the coral, you know. It, people would be hysterics. You'd, the go, fish. you'd go behind the coral? You'd oh, take yeah. the time to go yeah, behind yeah. it? Yeah, because guys could see you out through the okay. thing, you know. And the fish figured it out. Yeah. So as soon as you went out there bare ass, if you had a wetsuit on, they didn't bother you. But you were bare ass, man. You were just surrounded <laughs> with fish. And as soon as you did your thing, they attacked. You know? They knew. <laughs> oh, yeah. They're like, hey, look, that naked guy's swimming around. We know what that's about. So anyway, we, we did that. I was with a Frenchman that couldn't speak any English, which was interesting. Nice guy. And another American, the three of us. 
And then uh, he smuggled down a bottle of orange juice and some cheese. And as soon as we got down there, it imploded. And orange juice all over the inside of the thing. Why did he smuggle down orange juice? <laughs> he wanted orange juice. You know, we didn't, didn't get fed very well. We had yeah. to eat astronaut food, you know, out of a tube and all that stuff. Yeah. They had pretty good meals, I guess. There were four groups in the one I was on. I was the last leg. By the time they got to our group, they'd run out of all the good food. We had to eat turkey tetrazzini for a week. Uh, I never eaten a since. <laughs> dehydrated turkey tetrazzini. I guess they mix it with water or something. I don't get how. Okay, so you guys are in this habitat and they're studying, yeah. you know, weightlessness, right? So yeah. if you're out scuba diving, I get it because you're kind of like floating in the. Well, even inside the the habitat, we're under pressure, you know. So. You're under pressure, but you're yeah. not weightless. No, well, somewhat, but not no. Really, more, we were diving all day, so really I quite see. more of the diving. You're so right. they really encourage you to dive a lot. Well, we wanted to. We were yeah. doing science, you know. We were all uh, working and stuff, so it was great. So then we were out near the edge of the drop-off. There should be a, There it is. Yeah, show that map. You can just leave I that. just dropped my That's microphone. Fine. Am I still on? Yeah, you're still on. Okay. <laughs> so this is the artist the rendering, left, right? On the left side, you see the little light in? There's a little habitat there? Uh-huh. So this is the artist rendering, right? Yeah, this is artist, yeah. And, of course, the reef doesn't look right, but then there's little places along the way where you could stop and go up and talk to people. The little bubbles. Mm -hmm. Plastic bubbles. <laughs> one guy was a smoker, and uh, he'd take a smoke break in one of those. He had things? a cigarette wrapped in tin foil, so he'd go out to one of those things, and uh, he'd get up there, and the water's up to about here, and he uh, and he'd unwrap his. Was this the Frenchman? Hmm? No, <laughs> this is the guy uh, from the government from I've Washington. Been down DC. here too long. So he gets the cigarette out, gets his mouth, and he takes the match and light. Of course, the flame went about, got his ear, burned his <laughs> eyebrows, the front of his hair. So this, these were... But he got high oxygen, of course, under pressure, you know. Yeah, it's interesting. So he got the cigarette lit, and he said he got one puff, and then whoop. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, the other thing we did, we had that picture back. Yeah. You see down at the right corner? There should be another picture, a detail of that. There we go. That's the Johnson Sea Link, a submersible. And that's okay. got two containers in it. The forward one is acrylic for the pilot and the cameraman from the BBC. And the right. back one, well, now we can't see it. The back one uh, was for us. It was a very small one. It was pressurized. There you go. There's a picture of me or whoever locking out of it. I'm connected with a hose. Now, we're supposed to use mixed gas because of the depth. Okay. But guess what? They'd run out of mixed gas by the time I did my dive, so I did it on air, which was pretty deep for How'd they run out of mixed gas? I don't know. That's they had they helium, claimed. but they didn't have nitrogen. They didn't have the right, you know, something they, they ran They didn't out have of. helium or whatever? Some of the other divers ahead of us sucked too much in, I okay. guess. So for whatever reason, we were, uh, we were on that. So as you can see uh, there, I, I started out and I go over to the wall, and I'm working on the wall with a hammer trying to get this big sponge it's a calcareous sponge. Uh, Yale University wanted this sponge for their collection. So I'm over there beating on it. And the BBC guys, you know, filming me, they're over here. And all of a sudden, I see something in my, in my eye. And I'm pretty narked anyway. And I was trying to concentrate. How deep were you? About 300 feet. 300 feet. So you... On air. You exit at... Yeah, that's... <laughs> That's but, deep. of course, I had been saturated at 60 feet, but I guess that helped a little bit, but I don't know. I, don't anyway, so I think it made it worse. I don't know. Because it's, I, I you was, know, from 60... I just was trying to concentrate on yeah. getting that damn sponge, you know. And, and the guy, my tender in there, the wise guy, we all had Speedos on, you know. Yeah. He takes his Speedo off. He comes out of the thing where we were with no gear swims around in front of the sub and does this in front of the sub and the cameraman. That's ballsy. And, and swims back and goes in. We got in a lot of trouble over this. And, of course, it ruined the film. I, they, my shot got on the cutting room floor. They never showed me in the does movie. Does that exist somewhere? I would love to see that. I don't know. I think That'd they, be hilarious. I think they got rid of it real quick. Well, we got called. I hadn't do anything. I was out there working, you know. Yeah, who cares? But it's they, a stunt, oh, they, right? The guy that was with us that got canned, I think, they were really, because it was very dangerous. Now, you said you, he could hold his breath longer. Well, sure, at that depth. So at that depth, he's got, you know, I think we talked eight about... Eight or the, nine atmospheres, something like that. Huh? So he should be able to hold his breath for eight or nine times longer that's than right. you would at the surface. That's right. So that's, he knew that. You know, he that's was a crazy. pretty experienced guy. But it was crazy because if he hadn't have gotten back in... I screwed. He was uh, dead, you know. I mean, well, maybe. I don't know. Maybe it so, beat your record. Anyway, that was my... 
Aquanaut. <laughs> That's crazy. That's so cool. So you also have a book here. I do. Yeah, we'll end on this, this Views from, from the Conning Tower. we talked about, plus a lot more. Take a look. Yep. It's on Amazon. The Adventures of a Deep Sea Explorer. That's the title of this talk. So we're going to put the link in the description. You got some cool pictures here of all the stuff that we talked about, all the, all the tender boats. Yeah, all, that's, all that's really adventures. cool. All the adventures. So this is available on Amazon. Yeah. You can check it out. Yeah. yeah. They, uh, they print it on demand. You know, if you order it, they print it and yeah. send you a copy. It's a lot better than trying to sell your own copies. Yeah, you don't you have 400 yeah. copies course, in your living room. You know, some months I get three dollars or four dollars, and hey, you know, why not? one time one time I got seventy. This month you're going to get this huge yeah, check. I might because get, of, I might get ten bucks this, this right? month. Yeah. You know? Most of it's sold on Kindle, and you don't get much money for Kindle. Really? Yeah. I feel like you should get more money because they don't have to print no, it. No, right? Kindle's only four bucks or something. Isn't it? I don't know for the book. The book's twenty bucks. Yeah, you can set your price. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I it's, love the Kindle, though. That's a, it's, it's a great uh, way to read books. Uh, the only other thing we didn't talk about was the Edmund Fitzgerald. Oh, tell us about that. Uh, we got this, I don't want to say crazy, but <laughs> guy that, one of these guys that knows everything about a shipwreck, you know, in detail. And he, and he, his life thing was to raise money to dive on this ship. Uh-huh. And everybody knows about the Edmund Fitzgerald. It was 780 feet long. I think. Wow. It was big. How did it go down? It was in a storm. And they don't know exactly, but they think it, it bottomed out. It hit a sandbar or something. Mm -hmm. You know, it was off course. And, and it cracked it. Mm -hmm. And then it sank. And it, and it went into two pieces. You can see it there. There's the bow is up in the north there. And the stern is upside down. Now, what now do you the problem use this type is, of diagram for? You see for? that line slashing through it? Uh huh. That's the Canadian U.S. border. <laughs> what? So this is a, the, <laughs> half what, the wreck. What? Half the wreck is in Canada and half of it is in the United States. And so you had to get permits and people were watching what you're doing and all that, you know, and it's kind of a mess. Um, and unfortunately, one of my guys was diving with somebody and they got away from the ship a bit and would turn around and come back and they found a body. Now, in the, I've never seen a body on a wreck. All the wrecks, I've dove on hundreds of wrecks. I've never seen a body or any human things. It's, it's gone within a year or six mm -hmm. months. You know. But this is fresh water and it's also very deep and it's anaerobic at the bottom, mm -hmm. no, no life. And so things are preserved. It wasn't much of a body. It was a, uh, a life preserver with some bones sticking out of it, mm -hmm. you know. And so we said, ah, oh, you know, don't want, to, don't want to talk about this, you know. Yeah. But the guy that hired us, he goes around giving talks on the Evan Fitzgerald. And, of course, what's he do? He shows a picture of the body. And all hell broke loose. The Canadian government passed a law saying you can't photograph a body in a wreck just yeah. because of us. And to get back there again would have been impossible, probably. I mean, we were really persona non grata, you know, because we found the body. Yeah. But... It, as most ships wrecked, you can see that picture, almost all shipwrecks, they're sitting upright on the seafloor. You know, they sink and they kind of plow into the bottom. Uh -huh. uh, the Titanic left a big ditch. That's how they found it. They saw, saw the ditch where it dragged along the bottom. You know? Same with the uh, Edmund Fitzgerald, same with the Lusitania. Uh, so it kind of maintains its stability on its see, way down. See, these ships are big and the water's not that deep and so the bow hits the bottom and the stern's still sticking out of the water. Lusitania was that way too. Yeah. And it breaks easily because they doesn't, ships aren't built to hold up like that so they all break in half. Right. And on, on the Edmund Fitzgerald, uh, the stern is upside down and maybe a couple hundred feet away. On the Lusitania, it's just cracked. It opened up uh, the trouble with the Lusitania is it was, I don't know, 10, 10, 10 decks maybe. Uh -huh. And it's just all squished down to about 30 feet. So oh, the wow. decks are only that far apart. So you can't. What crushed them? Pressure. Plus World War II, they used it for bombing practice. Oh, there's, really? There's, there's all kinds of bombs around it, you know. The, for, most of them are dummies. But Hopefully. You never know. Ballard and I were sitting there one time and 
He said, oh, God. I said, what? He said, we're sitting next to a bomb. <laughs> yeah. I hope it's not live. You know, yeah, I know. Yeah. Don't know. We'll just get the hell out of Stuff here. Stuff lasts know? forever, too. You know, they're the other always thing you find on these wrecks, the Lusitania, I really remember, is uh, you don't find human remains, but you find shoes. And if you find two shoes together, you know there was a body laying there. That's pretty creepy. Yeah, it is. Sometimes a belt, a leather. Uh -huh. you know, but shoes are very common. We see a lot of shoes. Is that pretty eerie when you find that? Yeah, it is kind of eerie. You know, Bob was very strong about not touching anything. Uh -huh. uh, and again, I disagreed with him. There's a museum on shore. They started with Lusitania. And it's rotting away. You know, we could have brought the telegraph up. You know, we yeah. saw the tele the telegraph was forward, so it was going full speed when it sank. So it went. I you know, makes sense, it right? You crashed. see that torpedo. It was trying to get to shore. Yeah. And it just hit the bottom, and the stern's out, broke in half, and huh. fell to the bottom. Uh, Twelve hundred people died. Yeah. Very sad. You know. So that's crazy. Well, hey, Rich, thanks for coming by. Doing? We appreciate you. We're so glad that you're a member now, even well, though we can't you. give you it's a number. It's an honor. It's I would an love honor to give to you a number. It's not my place. <laughs> one, two, blah, blah. Yeah, one, two, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, so member Rich Slater, member one, two, blah, blah. thank you for coming by. We appreciate you. Um, if you guys are watching the stream, if you, if you like it, please subscribe to our channel. We're here next Thursday as well. Who's our guest next Thursday, Andy? Hold that thought. Let's get to some questions. I know you got some questions for this guy. We have any questions from the YouTube channel? I know I'm throwing a lot of stuff at you right now. Sure do. Give me one second. Yes, yes, we have a few. I'll remember who our next speaker is in the meantime. All right. For sure. Um, oh, I do remember who our next speaker is. All right, so first question comes from Serious Improv, and he wants to know, uh, first of all, thank you to everyone in the chat. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, Lots of folks uh, commenting tonight, so great to see you all, and uh, thanks for the questions, everyone. So, first question from Serious Improv, and he wants to know, that they want to know, uh, Cape Town is known for sharks. Did you have any run-ins? <laughs> With Cape Town sharks? Yeah. Actually, I didn't do that much diving in Cape Town, unfortunately. I was working on a boat, yeah. offshore oceanography. Uh, mainly not Cape Town so much, but the south coast of South Africa, more by Durban and stuff, uh -huh. is where they do the cage diving. I don't think they do ca that cage diving right at Cape Town. I could be wrong now because it's become a big deal down there. Take people out in cages and they yeah. chum. Uh, we were working in the Bahamas one time for, um, oh heck, what was that? Wild Kingdom. Yeah. Remember that Wild Kingdom? Yeah. The guy from St. Louis Zoo. And we were going to film sharks in the Bahamas for him. Mm -hmm. And we cut this dead cow and cut it all up and we dragged it through the water, bloody cow. We dragged that thing for three days, never got a shark. We had the <laughs> sub ready to take him down, you know, yeah. get a picture underwater. Never got one. You could have just drugged that pantsless Frenchman that aquanaut out there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What else we got, Andy? Got some more questions in that chat? For sure. Uh, next question comes from Carlos Mode Gahan. Uh, and this is in regards to the Necton Beta. Did you get to keep any of the 5.3 million? <laughs> yeah. We kind of talked about $30, that. $30,000 worth of it, right? Yeah, 30,000. And, and you had to buy one coin back. <laughs> yeah, and I had to buy a coin back. Yeah. Uh, no, All right. Most of it went to the state. Yeah. Well, not the state, the lawyers. Oh, and then, fighting of course, the, state, the people right? that paid for the coins, the auction. Yeah. The lawyers were over a million bucks. They were really expensive. Yeah. Yeah, I guess if someone finds a shipwreck, some lawyers are rejoicing somewhere. Yeah. What, uh, one more question. What do we got? Uh, this next thing's not a question, but it is a comment from Stephen Slater. Looking good, Daddy-O. Good to see you in the chat. There you My go. My son. Yeah. yeah. And then... Uh, Thanks, Steve. And then the uh, final question comes from Linda Abrams, who wants to know, would you be willing to do an entire evening talk on the Lusitania? Sure. Oh, that'd be I've a good one. Many. I've done many, yeah. Well, I know the guy well, to the talk to. The anniversary was two years ago, or more than that now. And I went around and talked to different groups about the Lusitania. But it's a fascinating story, and I'd love yeah. to do it, yeah. I think that'd be a good one. This is a good good. overview, but I think we need to dive deeper on some of well, this stuff. Well, there's a lot of details, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, mainly on the history of it and how it sank and that kind of thing. All right, we got one more question in the chat. Last question. 
Last question comes from Steve Bine, and he wants to know, did you have any interaction with any of our other members, specifically Ralph White, Emery Kristoff, or Don Walsh? Well, I was a good friend of Ralph's and a good friend of, uh, who was the other ones you mentioned? Don Walsh. Em Emery Kristoff. Oh, Kristoff. Oh, Don yeah, Walsh. I know Kristoff very well. Uh, is he a member here? Yeah, apparently. Yes, sir. They let him in. They let me in, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> no, Emory's all right. You guys qualify? He was for a photographer sure. for National Geographic. Uh -huh. uh, he was a good guy. Ralph was a good guy. He was a pilot on uh, Alvin. And mm -hmm. I made some dives in Alvin. We did some deep dives, 5,000, 6,000 feet in Alvin. What's down there, 5,000, 6,000 Not much. Feet. Yeah. And it takes you two hours to get down there. You know, you'd, we used to listen to old... Lone Ranger tapes and Green Hornet tapes. <laughs> you're cramped. You're sitting like this, you know, there's three people. And it takes you two hours like that. And you get to the bottom and you look out and you look around and maybe take a sample. Then you go back up for two hours. <laughs> oh, I'd much rather do the shallow stuff like we did. Yeah. You know? We could make up to eight dives a day. Yeah. Know? I made over 5,000 dives total. So. How much bottom time do you think you have in a submersible? Well, in the sub, anything? they probably average an hour, an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. You know, made some long dives, eight-hour dives, but made a lot of bounce dives, taking people, students down, things like that. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I haven't totaled up the bottom time, but uh, I've seen a lot of the seafloor. Quite a bit, huh? <laughs> I've been to 228 countries, according to uh, what is it, Century Club in LA. But have you been to the MTP Most Traveled Persons website? No. But the problem is they count like Scotland and Wales as separate countries where they're really Great Britain. Yeah. So the United Nations doesn't count them as separate countries. Yeah. If you just go by United Nations, I've been in 168, I think, out of the 190s. So. You should check out mtp.travel, which is a, it's a cool website to track. And, and some of our members vie with other people to be the most traveled person oh, yeah. in the world. It's a pretty good tracker. You know, you can go on there and you're like, click, I've been there, I've been there, I've been there, I've been there. You'll real rack it up pretty again? quick. MTP.travel. MTP.travel. And I'm sure we'll have a program on that pretty, pretty soon because we, right. we have the most traveled or the second most traveled. It is fairly controversial. But we have that person in the club, so we want to try to get him on the program. Oh, how many has he program. got? Uh, I'm not sure exactly, but he has the most or the second most, depending on how you count. Wow. And I'm sure he'll... You know, I, the ones I'm missing are Central Africa, uh -huh. a lot of, and a couple here and there, uh, Afghanistan. I've been to Iraq and Iran, Syria, and I'm not going to go to those places. Yeah. Know? So I don't think I'll add many more. Well, maybe after next week's presentation. But but, but thank you for being here. Thank you and for asking as, me. And as, as my memory has returned to me, next week we have Mark White is going to be on the program, and he is a former president of the club. And he's going to be talking about his summer trip to Iraq and Pakistan, backpacking around, having a good time in those, those he describes them as very safe countries. <laughs> so it's going to be an interesting program next week. Please join us here at 745 next Thursday to hear Mark Weitz talk about his travels in Iraq and Pakistan. From the Adventures Club in Los Angeles, I'm Rich Mayfield. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us at the Adventurers Club of Los Angeles. If you liked that video, please subscribe to our channel and don't forget to like and click the bell.